Hey guys, this is Caspi with Tape, and today you join me for episode 6 of Road to Colonization. And we start with the Eagle One launched very early in Road to Exploration, finally arriving at Jewel. It ran out of electric charge a long time ago because it had very few solar panels on it, and now it's just finally flying past. The Eagle Two has actually already arrived and gotten into orbit. Um, well, by the time this has arrived, but you can see nicely that the uh, moons are orbiting a kind of pretty demonstration of orbital mechanics, which we got from the uh, Ju Juno mission in real life as it arrived at um, at Jupiter. Anyway, so the first proper thing we're doing uh, this with uh, this turn, this episode, is launching a brand new rocket. This is the Pulsar Z, not the Pulsar Z, the Pulsar Z, because it's Britain. Anyway, but yeah, it's a slightly bigger version of the Pulsar Y. Um, basically, it just has a bunch of outer fuel tanks, and it has six engines instead of five. And it gives it a much higher um, lifting capability because we have a pretty massive payload in the cargo, in the fairing today. This is a probe that will hopefully go and land on EVE, and then get into orbit of EVE. I did send one of these, um, uh, I think in Road to Exploration, but it was poorly built, and it kind of flipped out and exploded. But this is much bigger, much kind of bulkier, and hopefully won't flip out on entry of EVE. But yeah, you can see it's quite a... Quite a decent rocket. It's pretty much the same as the Pulsar X, just with a few, with a bit more fuel and a few more fuel tanks. Not, yeah, a few more fuel tanks and a couple more engines. So we're actually going to shut off the engine just before it runs out of um, its main fuel, so we have a little more fuel to practice landing on. It does still land on parachutes um, and engines, which at some point I would like to change. Someone did comment that they would like to see. Um, a proper you know, kind of hover slam landing, how the real rockets land, and they suggested you could do that with KOS, and I think I have mentioned that before, that I could probably write some code to do it, um, which would be pretty cool, actually. I just haven't gotten around to it, um, but maybe I will, because it would be cool to see it land properly propulsively. Anyway, um, we're pushing on to, into orbit now with the second stage, ditching the fairing, unve unveiling the massive kind of vehicle here. It's, I think, uh, 70 tons, but because of the size of the fairing, um, we needed a bigger rocket. So anyway, uh, yeah, here we are just shutting down uh, four of the six engines and um, letting us uh, unlocking the kind of reserve fuel tank and firing up the engines, deploying the air brakes and watching it fall to, into the ocean. Now, given that we were using the same second stage, um, this has gone pretty far from the KSC, which means we're not going to get that much. Well, we're going to get most of the money back for it, but less than we usually would. So I might try and fix that a little bit in future. Anyway, so we're just going to touch down on the ocean rather beautifully with two engines and hopefully not explode because this is kind of unbelievably expensive. Uh, so we'll recover that. And now uh, we're just going to bring back the second stage um, as it kind of drops through the atmosphere. It's going to land in the dark annoyingly, as you can see here. It's just a blaze in, a, in the night sky. And then we uh, touch down. We actually touch down pretty close to the KSC, but a little hard because I didn't fire up the engines enough, and it had more fuel in it than I kind of thought it did, so, yeah. Anyway, back in orbit, we've got ourselves our encounter planned with Eve. It'll come just within the um, sphere, of, sphere of influence, and then we'll pull it in later with a um, plane change maneuver and a kind of tweak. But yeah, so we're just going to fire up the five nuclear engines. I went for five, which seems kind of like a lot, but this is a pretty heavy spacecraft. Other than the Duna vehicles, this is probably the heaviest probe I've ever um, sent out of the Kerbin system, because... I think the previous record holder would have been the previous EVE uh, ascent vehicle, which, you know, burned up in the atmosphere. Um, but yeah, so I did go for five, even though it's a little less efficient. But it means I can do all of this in one burn, and I really, really hate having to do two different burns. It's just uh, so much effort, and, you know, uh, I don't know, I'm lazy. <laughs> if I were running NASA, it would be far less efficient somehow. And, um, yeah, very lazy. Anyway, but yeah, you can see that on top of this is a big uh, dish antenna. And the problem before was I mounted that underneath the spacecraft, which meant that it was really horribly balanced. But now this is on top. It's going to break away before we land. And that'll provide communications when we're on the ground. Um, and the uh, so that when we're launching, we'll be able to bounce a signal off the ground um, dish and, you know, back to Kerbin, which hopefully should uh, allow us to, um, you know, fly with some kind of control. Anyway, yeah, so that's on its way, and we'll see that hopefully in a couple of episodes or something, and yeah. Anyway, so back at Duna, we've been researching a lot of stuff in our labs, actually all of our labs all over the solar system, which is pretty much just Kerbin and Duna. But yeah, we've got about 300 science in here, which we need to transmit home because we need some new stuff. Same with the base. 
Um, the lab has been busy at work uh, figuring out the mysteries of the red soil. And yeah, we're going to transmit that back. Now, this still has a bit of an um, electric charge deficit because it only charges properly at certain times of day. So I may have to fix this um, or turn off some of the farms and carbon extractors because... Yeah, they're just kind of using a lot of electric charge, and yeah, I should probably bring some better solar panels next time, um, which I probably will. And then yeah, back on the Odin station, we're gonna send uh, we're gonna send all of the science back another three hundred ish, I think. Um, so yeah, we'll just send that back, and we'll be able to unlock some important things. I only think I think I only have three or four nodes left to unlock on the science tree, so it would be good to get them. And the main one we want to get today is the narrow band scanners, the stuff that allows us to. Um, find precisely where ore is on the surface of um, planets and moons. And we built a little satellite with those parts, and we've loaded it into an SSTO. So yes, an SSTO, if you watch Road to Exploration, you might be like, but you've never used one in this entire series. Well, <laughs> I um, built the probe that would scan um, ore on Minmus, because that's what this is going to be doing. But it was only about two tons, and I don't have any rockets that small, so I thought I might as well throw together a quick SSTO. This is called the Nighthawk 1, or something like that. Um, and it's a fairly simple SSTO, I quite like it. It's using ramjets and liquid fuel engines because I haven't unlocked rapiers, and also rapiers are actually a little less efficient, I think. But yeah, this is just going to power on into orbit and drop the little uh, probe, and then come back, hopefully. Coming back is actually kind of difficult. Um, so yeah, into four times time, accelerate so we can see the entire launch. Um, just kind of pushing up and trying to get as much speed because these uh, engines, you know, they get more thrust the more speed you have. So you want to be able to kind of gain some speed in the lower atmosphere and get on into, so you can get enough speed higher in the atmosphere to get on into orbit. So yeah, then we fire up the liquid fuel noxidizer engines and uh, when these throttle down, we're going to shut them down using an action group. And then yeah, power on into orbit. It's a fairly simple SSTO. I actually haven't done SSTOs in a while, probably since... I don't know, but it's been a while, I, I rarely do them anymore, so I just went really simple at first, and this is pretty cheap. I also only put one Kerbal in it because I haven't returned an SSTO in a while, so if this does explode on re-entry, I'd rather only one Kerbal die. Um, and yeah, so we didn't tell the Kerbal that, we were like, yeah, but you're so good, you don't even need a co-pilot, but in reality it's like, let's minimize our losses. Anyway, we just need to decouple the probe now. Um, however, I decouple it without realizing that I haven't actually deployed the antenna. But luckily for us, we have a Kerbal here who can uh, get out and do that because, well, you know, it would be kind of sucky just to leave it in orbit dead. Um, so we get the Kerbal out naturally because, oh no, okay, I, I, now we get the Kerbal out. <laughs> and naturally because it's KSB, she flings off the ladder like a crazy because... I don't know, ladder physics are apparently very difficult. And then we're just going to move back over. Um, and it's also put the spacecraft in a bit of a rotation, which is a little worrying. But it's fine, I can get back in there. It's cool. Um, so yeah, we're going to deploy that antenna manually. Just yank it out of there, probably break it, it doesn't matter. And then we're going to get back into the... Uh, back into the spacecraft, bringing the spacecraft under control, and then get the uh, probe out of the cargo bay. It's kind of jammed in there a little bit, so... I mean... We're probably going to want to really, you know, wiggle it on out of there, um, which is, yeah, well, it has RCS, we'll just kind of push it on out there. Um, yeah, there we go, just kind of, just sort of force it out, and starts pulling the um, plane, which is good, because the plane's actually pretty low on fuel right now, and this drops its periapsis a little bit. Still outside of the atmosphere, but just enough. Anyway, we finally get free, and this is uh, safe to go on. Uh, on its mission to Minmus, using just those modern propellant engines and thrusters. Anyway, we need to deploy the solar panels because we're going to take the um, plane back first and then go and do this. Yeah, this is just using those little modern propellant engines, which actually gives it 2,500 meters per second of delta V, which is pretty impressive, actually. Um, but yeah, anyway, so we're just going to do a quick deorbit burn with a little bit of fuel we have left. You can see we're really low on oxidizer, um, but it's more than enough to get ourselves deorbited. However, I do put the periapsis in a pretty bad position. It's much too close to the KSC, so we're probably going to fall short on the way back. Um, but luckily, this does have wings and jet engines and a little bit of fuel for those jet engines, so it should be able to get relatively close to the KSC. Um, but as I've said, um, I haven't uh, done SSTOs in a while, so I'm not actually exactly sure where you need to put the periapsis to get 
all the way back to the KFC. And you can see as we're coming back, we start heating up a lot, which kind of freaks me out. So I pull a pretty serious angle of attack so we can slow down more in the upper atmosphere before we hit the really thick stuff um, so that we don't burn up. Because this is a pretty fragile little plane. Um, it's not using the big bulky wings or anything. Uh, but yeah, it seems to be doing fine. Um, just if you keep a good angle of attack, it should be fine. Uh, the space shuttle actually did something similar to this, although it did it in the high atmosphere with some kind of ni almost 90 degree turns. It would turn one way and then turn the other, which means that it could also adjust its trajectory, but also bled off quite a lot of um, qu uh, quite a lot of uh, velocity just by using its wings to create a lot of drag. Anyway, we seem to have gotten uh, through the you know really difficult bit of re-entry, so now we're just going to pump some fuel around and fire up those ramjets and get up to some speed and stay high because that's the best way to use these um, jet engine, these ramjets is as high in the atmosphere as possible. Um, I could actually go probably higher than this, but at the time I wasn't really um, paying much attention. However, foolishly, I, I left them on full, uh, full throttle for quite a long time and burned a lot of my fuel, whereas I could get um, probably 80% of the speed for a third of the throttle because of the way drag works, I don't know. Um, and yeah, so, but nonetheless, it's still flying and we should get over this ocean. Now, the really worrying thing would be if we did run out of fuel over the ocean because this has pretty small wings um, because I wanted to keep weight down. Uh, because it's pretty much just a rocket that sort of has wings, um, that kind of flies 45 degrees on takeoff. Uh, but yeah, so it doesn't have amazing cross-range distance. Um, in future, I might build slightly bigger wings, but yeah, for now I think it's fine. Um, but yeah, the other problem is it could become very unstable in the atmosphere, because the wings are very far back, because... Um, the mass, the center of mass is so far back, so actually empty. I'm not sure if it is stable because I also built it sort of like I built fighter planes because those are most of the planes I build. Um, but yeah, I think it's actually fine. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, we realize we're not going to get over those mountains and we'd rather not try and land on the mountains. So we pull a little uh, dive, flip around, and we're going to try and land in this uh, some of these grasslands um, so that we can sort of, you know, hopefully touch down some sort of flat-ish land, and we're close enough to the KSC that we should get most of the money back. Um, and we'll go into one times time accelerator for the landing so that you can see the beauty of uh, the beauty of how I land planes. I've deployed the um, tail plane so that it increases drag a little bit, and we're going to flare just before the landing so we can bleed off as much velocity as possible, because it's quite bumpy terrain, so we want to be landing really slowly so we can break pretty quickly. I didn't put any parachutes on this because I kind of threw it together a bit, actually. Um, I didn't spend too long working on it, but yeah, it's a pretty good first prototype, and it completed its mission very successfully. I'm very happy with it, and we'll definitely be using more SSTOs in the future, mostly because they're just cool. I've been using rockets too much, but they're reusable. It's so great. Anyway, back in orbit, um, we've planned our maneuver to Midmus, and we're just going to fire up the engines and head on out there so we can figure out where the ore is, so we can put down our mining base, because we don't want to keep paying for fuel. I mean, all of Road to Exploration, I shipped all of my fuel up to the homie station, and I don't want Odin to be like that. I want it to be having, mining the fuel on Minmus, putting it in a spacecraft, shipping it back so that we can do our missions for free. Just a huge amount of effort. Um, and uh, maybe repairs and kerbals and, you know, shipping up food and stuff. But I, but yeah, I mean, who cares? I could chip up a greenhouse and a carbon extractor, it'd be fine. Anyway, so we need to do a bit of a tweak, obviously, to get um, into a polar orbit of Minmus so we can scan, because a polar orbit allows you to get everything, because it, the moon's rotating b beneath you. So yeah, we do that, and we're going to head on up there now, hopefully into a decent position. Um, there is actually another scanner up there that's done the majority of the scanning. The na the Is it the wideband scanner? The uh, really big one that kind of tells you roughly where the ore is? I've actually never really mined any ore in KSP. I used to do the Keythane mod thing, um, in the old days, uh, where we'd kind of, it was pretty much the same system, just a little less advanced, more advanced, I don't know, I think it was easier. Uh, but yeah, so I've never actually used the narrowband scanner. Um, I have, I think I've mined ore from, um, oh, I've mined, uh, yeah, I have mined ore uh, in, in the last series, I did a little one, and I have mined it from um, asteroids before, I guess. So yeah, I, I, I do know what I'm doing roughly, but I've never used a narrowband scanner, is what I was trying to say. So I don't actually know what to do with this, I just kind of know that I need one. Um, so yeah, anyway, we arrive at Minmus rather nicely and get into orbit. We actually have a pretty, pretty decent amount of stuff on Minmus. We have a space station around it, and we have a little base on the surface, but those were pretty much just to, um, just to complete 
some contracts and facilitate some early emissions, um, but we haven't really used them at all. Anyway, so we turn on the scanner, um, and you can see this is what we already know. So if I turn on the UI, you can actually see what's below me. I've just got to kind of find the resource that's actually ore, uh, which is the pink one. There we go. There's some ore. And if I keep refreshing, you can see... I guess a detailed map. I don't really know what any of these numbers or kind of shapes mean. I know the pink on the little radar thing um, tells you where it is. And then there's a bunch of percentages. So I don't really know how to pick out a good landing site. But anyway, I guess, tell me in the comments. Um, anyway, so the final thing we're doing today is a quick uh, plane change for the Eagle 3, which is our newest dual probe heading on to Jewel. And you can see here, as I zoom out into the map, how many probes I have heading to other planets. I just send them out at every transfer window. Um, it's actually not that clear now, but if I zoom out in a second, um, you can see just sort of how many... Yeah, there's a lot of probes going places. Anyway, um, so I tell the flight computer to do this burn, actually. This is just a plane change, but I'll have no connection when the burn starts. So I've told the flight computer to do it, and it fires up the engine quite nicely. So yeah, this will hopefully finally get to Jewel, because the first one I sent, which you saw at the, f the start of the episode, actually, um, that was the first one I ever sent, which took ages to get there and ran out of electric charge completely and just will fly by and do nothing. The second one I sent also um, ran out of electric charge, but it used a Tylo assist and did get into orbit. Hopefully this one, now that it's using um, RTGs, will not run out of electric charge and will be able to get all of the science that we need. Um, yeah, and do a bunch of contracts and just get us loads of money. But yeah, the burn is locked in. And it looks like we will be arriving at Jewel, which is good because I, I, I failed so much at Jewel in this, well, in last series and probably this one. But yeah. So anyway, but this is the end of the episode and I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you want to go check out a couple more videos, there is my latest episode of Fall of Kerbin in which we just destroy Penguin. We take back Valley's Guard, spoilers, we just, we do a bunch of great stuff. It's awesome. You should go watch it. Um, there's also my latest episode of Prison Architect in which... There's just a lot of violence. A lot of people get killed. So many people die. Um, there are also links to my Twitter, Twitch, and Patreon in the description if you're interested. But as always, I hope you've enjoyed this. This has been KSP with Tape. I'll see you next time.